Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. It's with Kelsey Cochran, who I met about a year ago in September of 2019. We recently reconnected and she told me about these amazing changes that were going on in her life and I wanted to have her come on the podcast. What you're going to hear in this episode is how Kelsey really started to learn about what she needed as a highly sensitive person and to embrace that and integrate it and really change up her life so that she was allowed to really expand in her life. And she's just made these amazing changes. And part of what she talks about is how difficult it was when she was really feeling constrained by her life and there just wasn't any room to give. And life was really hard. And now it's been really expansive. Kelsey and I were supposed to record an interview about a month ago, and her grandfather was very ill. And so we postponed it. And then when we got on the call this morning, she found out about an hour ago that her great great grandmother had died. And part of what we talked about, she was tearful. And I said, Do you want to reschedule? She says, No, I, I think it'll be good for me to do this recording. And when we ended the episode today, the recording, she had said that she was alone. And so her sister told her parents that her friend really needed to be with her when her mom told her that her grandmother had died. This all came about as Kelsey has learned about herself and what she needs. Her family has learned how to support her. Kelsey and I were talking that in this year, she's lost a couple of grandparents. She lost a horse. She lost one of her dogs. And we were reflecting after we stopped recording and she said, I wouldn't have been able to manage all of this in the past. I've really learned how to take care of myself, what I need. Obviously, we don't want to have loss in our lives, but it happens. But she said that it really would have been overwhelming had this happened earlier in her life. And because of the things that she's learned and how she's managing, it it just has really made a difference for her. I think you're really going to enjoy listening to Kelsey. Let me tell you a little bit about Kelsey. Kelsey Cochran is a highly sensitive person who lives in rural northern Arizona, She participated in the Fall HSP course in 2019, and she realized during the course that it was time to make some major changes. She left her job as a public school teacher, and she recently moved into the field of behavioral health and is pursuing a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. Kelsey is also participating in a positive reinforcement horse training program that better fits her and her wild horse's sensitivities. I would love to get information about you, the listener. I've created a survey in Google Docs. I'm going to put a link to the survey in the show notes. And if you go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com, you can either go to the survey page or you can go to the contact me page and scroll down on the bottom. This survey is anonymous. I will not spam you. I will not contact you. I don't know who you are. It will help me get to know you better as a listener. I'm trying to decide, do I want to do some episodes on dating or raising children? Because I don't have a good sense of who you are as a listener, I really want to create content that's going to work for you. As I've mentioned, I am hoping to monetize the podcast. This will also help me tell potential sponsors about the demographics of the listeners. You don't have to answer any of the questions if you feel uncomfortable. If you want to sign up to be on my mailing list, I talked about this almost two years ago, and I I think I actually may start sending out a newsletter. So there is a place if you want to sign up for my newsletter, you're able to do that. If you just want to do the newsletter pretty soon, I'm going to have that added to my website, hopefully in the next week or two. So now on to the show. Hey, Kelsey, welcome. Hi. I'm really excited to have you here today. Are you are you a little nervous? Just a little bit. I've never done anything like this before. I know. It can be really scary and intimidating. Is it helpful for you to talk about what you're feeling nervous about, or do you just want to move on? I'd like to just jump in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can we say what you call your gremlins, though? What I call gremlins, uh, you call... <laughs> I call it the Sasquatch. 
Because I like I like to picture like I'm a happy camper, and then the Sasquatch comes out of the woods and messes all of that up, and with the little voice in the background. Yep, yep. So thank you, Sasquatch. We're going to have a little interview. <laughs> do you identify as an HSP? I do. And when did you find out you were an HSP? Um, it was probably about two years ago. Um, I was visiting my sister in San Diego, and a car pulled up next to us in California traffic, and it had an unapologetically sensitive sticker on the side. And we kind of looked over at it and made a joke like, hey, that's you. Because I always get kind of picked on in the family for being the sensitive one. It said podcast and I, you know, I'm driving from Arizona. So I looked it up and listened to it all the way back and just absolutely found my people. You sent me an mm-hmm. email, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? I just connected that that was Oh my you. gosh. I, Yeah. Because I got decals that say unapologetically sensitive podcasts that, you know, my kids have it on their car. We have it on our cars. And I, and I remember because when I wanted to get decals, somebody who's like a marketing manager said like, that's just a waste of time. You know, you won't get anything out of them. And then I got this email from you and I thought, there, I'm so glad I trusted myself. And I've known you since last September, a year almost. I had no idea that that was like, I got your email, but I get so many emails that I did not realize that that was you. That is too funny. I mean, anything that says sensitive, it automatically is Kelsey. Mm -hmm. And so when we saw, you know, in traffic, just kind of looking out the window, it was like, hey, look, there's your car. Oh, that is too funny because I remember the email and I remember telling people like, see, they work. That is too funny. What do you think of the term highly sensitive person? At first, I really didn't like it because Mm -hmm. sensitivity pretty much my whole life had been a weakness or something to be ashamed of or something to be hidden. And it was never like, oh, you're so sensitive. That's great. It's you're so sensitive. Get it together. And so that was mm-hmm. kind of the messaging. So sensitive as a word for me was never positive until I found highly sensitive people and kind of went into this world of people who have similar experiences. Now I see it in a lot more of a positive light. But my first reaction was kind of like, ugh. Yeah. Yeah. What's the phrase that you've always heard around being sensitive? Do you know which one I'm talking about? Too sensitive. I think of suck it up. Suck it up, buttercup. I can't stand that. Yeah. <laughs> that makes my skin crawl. <laughs> like put your big girl panties on, or suck it up, buttercup. I'm like, don't be cute with me. I'm having a hard yeah. time. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Is there another term that you wish were used? I think some, maybe a term that is I guess in like Western cultures, more positively regarded than sensitivity because sensitivity does tend to have like a negative connotation with it. So something like perception, like high per- highly perceptive, mm-hmm. deep processing, or some, you know, just one of those like buzzwords that in our culture is be is seen as being really a great thing to have versus sensitivity, which is oftentimes viewed as something that's not so great to have, even though it is. Yeah. Yeah. I've started sometimes in some of my social media, I'll say, are you a deep thinker and a deep feeler and you care a lot about things just because we want something that people are going to identify with and people here sensitive and, you know, it just has a a little bit of a bad rap. Mm -hmm. You have made some major changes in your life and I haven't spoken to you directly. I'm so terrible with putting time together. It's, it's like I, I have some kind of executive dysfunction around time management So it's been almost a year since you took the online HSP course. And I think it ended around December is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Does that sound about right? Yeah. And so you've been in the closed Facebook group, but I don't think that I've really talked to you about some of the major changes that you're making. What We'll talk more specifically, but what do you think brought about making these major changes? I think being a part of that group gave me the self-realization that areas of my life that I was struggling in wasn't because I wasn't trying hard enough or I wasn't working hard enough or putting my best foot forward, but because of who I am as a person, it wasn't good for me. And so having the awareness of, oh, nothing's wrong with me. It's just this job might not be a good fit. This you know, training method for my horse might not be a good fit for who I am. And then embracing that all came through the group. There is, especially since COVID, what I'm seeing is 
I mean, this is not with COVID, but we tend to think that it's us that if we just would try harder. And I just finished up another round of the online HSP course, and there was someone who was taking, uh, she's also a teacher and was taking an online training. It was just not HS friendly. And she was talking about it in group. And I, I pointed out like, this is not you. This is, it's a systematic structural problem. And my guess is that you're not the only one that is experiencing this. And then with the online learning, my son, bless his heart, is having such a hard time in college. He has ADHD. He finally figured out how to be a good student. It took him a long time to get off academic probation. Then last semester, everything went online, and he really needs live classes to keep him engaged. He decided to withdraw last semester, which we're fine about. So he signed up for classes. It would be, and none of his classes had Zoom calls. It was all self-study. So he made sure to sign up this semester for classes that would have Zoom calls where he could interact and engage. Come to find out, not all of his classes are like that. And when we talked the night before school started, he was feeling like he should just be able to try harder. And it ties back to what you're saying, that when we know about ourselves and what we need, we don't have to blame ourselves and feel like we're failures. We know like this is what works and this is what doesn't. And I'm going to try and see if I can work around this given situation. And if I can't, then what do I need to do to take care of myself so that I don't feel like there's something wrong with me? So I think this topic is so important. And I think we tend to feel like it's our fault when we can't make things work out. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you were doing before and what your realization of why it wasn't working and then how you kind of came to this idea that you really wanted to make a career transition? Yeah. So I was a public school teacher for four years. I started in one small town and then moved to another small town. I worked on four different campuses, teaching five different grade levels, four different subjects. I just kept trying to switch around because I wasn't feeling good where I was at. And I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. So I thought maybe it's the campus, maybe it's the kids, maybe it's the subject, maybe it's the age, maybe it's the administrator. Like I tried changing everything and I still was just feeling unsettled where I was. I was easily stressed. I was overwhelmed. I would get home from work and I was so tired from the day that I didn't want to see friends or have dinner with my family. I just wanted to go to bed so I could wake up and do it again. And then the weekends were the same. I just wanted to kind of close the door and put a big blanket over my head and recharge because I was on empty all the time. Through the group, I had a realization that, oh, the loud noises, the chaos coming in contact with like 300 kids a day maybe isn't the best fit for a highly sensitive person. You know, even the bell between class, it's so loud and, and all of the, you know, the commotion of assemblies and things like that, maybe it's not a good fit. And so I tried doing some different things in my schedule at school. I tried implementing some classroom procedures to be a little bit more HS friendly. And ultimately those things weren't enough to put me in a good place. And so by about I think the course started in September and by about October, I had made my mind up that I was no longer going to teach, but I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I just knew I was going to be out of that school system because it wasn't good for me as a highly sensitive person. Right. And I can remember you talking about you not having time to take breaks or to go to the bathroom and there was no time for downtime that you were constantly on and there was really no opportunity for you to do any self-regulation to get your nervous system back in balance. As you're talking, my guess is that a number of teachers are also highly sensitive. I know people that have come through the course, we have a number of teachers or a number of teachers in the closed Facebook group, unapologetically sensitive. So as you're talking, I'm kind of thinking like, hmm, how is this for the teachers that are listening? Because it's not my intention to discourage anybody or to say, this isn't what you should be doing. We're really talking about what your experiences and what you realized and the things that you try to do and how you've made those changes. So everybody gets to decide for themselves what works and what you were doing didn't work. And now you found something that you're really excited Mm -hmm. about. Yeah. So I left teaching since I knew I was going to be done in May and at the end of the, the school year, I started to explore while I was still teaching what the other options were and what would be a good fit. So I kind of listed out things that I enjoy doing space. You know, what do I need in a workspace to not feel overstimulated? So a lot less noise, you know, maybe one-on-one interactions or small groups versus large crowds, things like that, where I can, can kind of control or insert breaks as needed. And, you know, you can't just leave a classroom of 40 kids whenever you need it. You know, you're kind of stuck where you're at for that 
nine hour day. I was looking at either paralegal work or behavioral health. So counseling, I took a psych 101 course at the local community college because it could have gone either way and fell in love. Like I was, I found my groove. (laughs) This was my jam. I was so excited. And so I um, enrolled at a university in Arizona and I started my master's program in December for clinical mental health counseling. Then this July, so the school year ended May online. So it was very different, but I really enjoyed being online because it was a nice kind of step away from the chaos, but I could still interact with the kids in a unique way. And then I found a job in July working as a direct support provider for at-risk youth and their families. And it's exactly where I need to be. It's perfect for me. That's amazing. I mean, that's just amazing. And I reached out to you for something that was totally unrelated to this and just said, hey, how are you doing? And you wrote back that you'd made all these changes. And I was just so surprised. I Sometimes I know what people are doing once they finish the course. And I often talk about that it takes time when you finish the course for, I think, all that information to integrate in for changes to happen. And it sounds like that's what happened Mm -hmm. for you, that you really got clear on, I really need to find something that's really going to honor who I am as a highly sensitive person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I mean, my my schedule right now with the company that I'm working for is pretty flexible. I get to schedule my own clients um, on different days and times that work for me. So I can build in time in between. Or if I have a client in one town and my next client is in another town, that 30-minute drive is all the recharge time that I need to feel ready for the next kid and the next family. And I'm also working in a smaller setting in their home or in the community or even back at the clinic. And it's not as on stage as I used to say teaching was. I didn't feel like I'm putting on a performance. I feel like I'm having real human connection in a way that suits me. It's interesting as you're talking, I'm reflecting on jobs that I've had before I even knew I was an HSP and seeing how HS friendly they were that I worked in adoptions and I did home visits. So it meant time in my car and I worked home health. And so it meant working with one person or their small family and going into their homes and having time in between breaks. Even in the hospital, we still had some autonomy over our schedules. And so that's part of what I'm hearing is that you have some autonomy over your schedule. When you schedule things, having time alone in your car. So you have more control over how much stimulation and input is coming in so that it's manageable for you. How at the end of the day, are you feeling like, are you feeling the same way that you did when you were teaching just incredibly depleted and needing downtime? No, I have so much more energy than I did before. And I don't think I realized what I don't want to say soul sucking. It sounds so dramatic, but really it was just draining me to E the entire day, the entire week for year after year. Whereas now I feel good. Like I can come home for about an hour and I'm ready to go. You know, if my, like just last night and I went and saw a movie with my friend, I haven't done that in so long (laughs) because I didn't have the energy to maintain relationships outside of the mandatory work relationships. And so to be able Mm -hmm. to kind of refuel my friendships And my relationships with my family has been huge. And I do feel completely different now. I'm starting to enjoy stuff again outside of work. Yeah. I'm I'm curious. I'm going to be a little vague about this just to be respectful of people's privacy. When you were taking the course, there were certain things in your environment, noise, sound, smell-wise, that were challenging for you to deal with. Are those still just as challenging? And if they are, it's okay. I'm not, I don't want you to make stuff up. A little bit. I don't know how specific I should get. I, my living situation. Keep it okay, vague. So my living situation, <laughs> I had some roommates that um, would maybe cook things or, or whatever. And it's gotten a lot better. I think I've been more firm with my boundaries. I'm not sure firm is the right word in terms of this is what I need to be okay. And it's something easy mm-hmm. for you guys to do. And so these transitions have mm-hmm. kind of happened over time. But the respect level there in terms of, oh, instead of doing it one way, when the other way is just as easy, if that's what is going to be better for her, then we'll do it a different way. And so I think that that's been a lot better 
since probably January or February this year. Things have been changing and are a lot more positive. How was it having to set boundaries? Because I know that was, it, it was a little challenging if I recall. Is that accurate? Do you, yeah. could, do you remember and can you speak to that? Yeah. So having a talk with somebody about, I'm having a hard time because of these things that are happening in our environment without saying you're doing these things and they're driving me nuts. It was kind of a balancing act to say things in a way that didn't get immediate defensiveness and didn't create tension, but actually ease tension in terms of I'm feeling really stressed because this noise, or I'm feeling really stressed because of this like weird smell in the house. It was difficult. And it was, I was like, I felt like I was having an outer body experience when I had that conversation because of my, you know, stress level was up, but it went so well that I'm glad that I did it. And since then, it's been so much easier to have those conversations because my worst case, you know, Sasquatch Kelsey that came in and was like, oh, everything's going to go terrible if you have this conversation didn't happen. And so now that door is open for future boundary setting and future conversations And it's worked the other way as well. Like they've been able to come to me and say, hey, when you, you know, leave, make sure this is done. I would really appreciate that. And it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings. And those boundaries are being respected from both sides. So it sounds like it's given permission to everybody to speak more freely, to have more safety and comfort in the home. When you set the boundaries, was it something that you needed to keep going back in and kind of making adjustments to the thought in my head is I think people think that I'm going to set a boundary and then that's it. And I don't ever have to do it again. And it's going to be perfect. So that's, that's kind of what I was thinking when I asked you that. Yeah. So they do have to be revisited sometimes. I think um, sometimes they'll forget or just get busy in life and maybe do something that to me would be inconsiderate because we've already had this conversation, but to them it's, it's not a big deal. So they're not thinking about it. It's a big deal to me, but it's not to them, if that makes sense. And so just, you know, even sending a text like, hey, I noticed this thing was out or this happened or this noise is going on in the middle of the night, then they're able to adjust and without issue. And then it doesn't happen again for quite a long time until maybe they forget Mm -hmm. or everyone forgets (laughs) something. But do you think that because when you were taking the course and I was hearing about on a weekly basis about the things that were feeling really challenging for you. We also know that you were in this environment working that was really, you just didn't have a chance to relax. Do you notice a difference now that you feel like you have a job that really kind of meets your HS needs? Do you find that, that the same intensity of things bothers you like it did before? Has that changed? Do you know what I'm asking you? I know exactly what you're asking me. So the way I, I'm a very visual learner. And so I can always like visualize pictures that kind of help me understand complex things. So the way I see it is at my other job, it's like a tree that's bent all the way down to the ground, like a little sapling is bent. So the littlest thing is going to break that branch, like the littlest thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I feel like I'm not being bent as far. So I can take little hits. I can weather little storms here and there, like it's nothing because I'm not all the way pulled down. Whereas when I worked at my other job, I felt like I was a a branch all the way pulled down. So the littlest storm would just snap that branch. And so that's kind of how I picture that. But since I started working in a more HS friendly environment, weird, terrible things can come up and I handle them in a way that I didn't even know was possible for me to handle them because I'm in a good space when those things happen. Yeah. I think COVID has also done this to us that many of us are stretched so thin and we've had to shift and make adjustments and change and the ongoing uncertainty is just for someone with that a tender heart that really feels the collective heaviness of what's going on that we just many of us don't have that bounce back that we normally do where something stressful happens and then we go like it's okay I can adjust and then we kind of like a rubber band like we're just stretched so tightly like you're sapling or I think you know, I have one last nerve and you're standing mm-hmm. on it. Mm-hmm. which in some ways I think is helpful because it helps us to really take care of ourselves, especially if it's about a life and death situation, depending on what your beliefs are. I really see this as an opportunity where many people are asserting themselves in ways that they normally wouldn't. But I think that this also happens that when we're under duress constantly, we don't get a chance to kind of reset our nervous systems. 
every little thing can just feel like it's a big hairy deal and and our ability to bounce back is just so limited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think made it easier for you or more willing to set boundaries than previously? I don't even know if that's the right language. So if you need to fix the language so it fits. I think the way that I was empowered to make these big changes and have these scary conversations was through modeling from other highly sensitive people within the group. So I would watch another group member go through something maybe unrelated with like a work issue, but watching them stand their ground, how they did it, what actually happened, having a reality check that I thought all these bad things might have happened. They didn't. It was safe. Good things happened. Kind of gave me the, I guess, like the path for how to do that in a way that fit highly sensitive needs. I don't know if that makes sense. Like being able to see how other people accomplish that task gave me more confidence that I could also accomplish it. Yeah. I really think that when we are seen and heard by people that get us and, and we're able to model our process, it just opens up this flow of energy. And I was just thinking, I I have a friend that I get together with on, you know, one day on the weekend, we get together for a few hours. I've been toying with the idea of doing a bonus episode about this. I've been really struggling in a couple areas of my life and I've been having a lot of resistance. And it's so easy to show up and to kind of be the person who knows and to give advice and to not be super vulnerable. And when we met yesterday, I I was thinking like, I really need to be, it's different in friendships. It's easy to kind of go into my little podcasting therapist role as opposed to my vulnerable human role. And I was really aware of this thing of like wanting my representative who always looks good to show up. And I thought, I really need to talk about these things I'm struggling with. And I did. And when we are with somebody that really hears us and sees us and doesn't have an agenda around fixing us or changing us, but we talked about it, it reminded me of the things that I love that I'm not experiencing because of my resistance around this behavior. And it's not like she tried to get me to fix it or change it. But I came home and something just really shifted. And I've really been thinking about this with COVID that, you know, I think many of us are having trauma responses to what's going on, the ongoing stress, the uncertainty. It's been hard. And I've reverted to a lot of behaviors that like I'm very clear are trauma responses. It's kind of what my go to. And if you would have told me to fix those things, that wouldn't work. But like I felt so seen and heard and embraced and somebody's just joining in that experience of how challenging it was, that made me feel so seen and heard that like I came home and I'm like, I kind of want to make some changes. And this kind of feels good as opposed to like, oh my God, I'm such a loser. And if I don't do this, you know, it didn't come from that place. And that's kind of what I hear you saying that you saw other people making changes and it just creates this synergy of what's possible. And then you kind of think I could do that too. Well, I'm getting that validation too from other highly sensitive people that, oh, this is a real issue that needs to be addressed because I can talk myself from here to the moon and back and justify pretty much anything. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Why are you making such a stink about it? Just calm down, be easy to get along with, like blah, 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 Sasquatch goes crazy. Having other people from outside the situation say, no, this is important. This deserves change. This deserves your time and energy was insane. I've never had that experience before to have that validation from people who experience the world in a similar way to what I experience. That was just crazy. It felt so good. <laughs> it felt so good. And and it was crazy how much it changed. Yeah. yeah. Which is ideally what we would have hoped that we would have gotten as kids, having parents or caregivers that really got us and understood us so that when we said, this is scary, this is hard, I'm nervous, I'm worried, they would have said, I hear you. And, and they would have seen us and helped us learn to navigate that So when it happened again, we wouldn't be thinking, well, I was told that I was just worrying too much. So maybe I'm worrying too much. Maybe I'm making a big deal. And I think that these groups have the potential to kind of get that almost reparenting experience of what it's like to be in a healthy, nurturing, supportive environment where you kind of get to relax and really show up and see what's possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think you were very fortunate in that your group was very cohesive And I I was actually thinking, and I'll try and remember to put it in the show notes, but Randiel was in your group. And if if I say somebody's name that wasn't, please correct me. We did a podcast episode. Heidi was Mm -hmm. in your group. We did a podcast episode. Kitty was in your group. We did a podcast episode. 
because there was just some amazing connection and growth that happened. And you all have stayed in touch Mm -hmm. since the group. And that's coming up on almost a year now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, Ranielle actually opened like a private Facebook page for us. And um, Nanette was actually the one who like started the email thread going during the group to stay in touch during the week because we all (laughs) were just like basking in the support of one another. And so we didn't want it just once a week. We wanted it more. And so she's the one who kind of started that email thread. And then Ranielle opened the Facebook page for us. It's a private group for just, just us. And I mean, we've posted pretty consistently for the last year. And recently we've kind of gotten a little more quiet, I think, as we've kind of come into our own but we're still there for each other. Like just the other day, there was a post of, Hey, I, you know, I need this. And another group member got on and was like, Hey, I'll be your buddy, you know, your accountability partner. And, um, so it was really, it's really cool that that support is still there when we need it. Yeah. And Kitty is one of the the hosts for the Thursday zoom call in the closed group, unapologetically sensitive. Nanette is very active in the group. You're active in the group. So, it, it, you know, I have no guarantee on who's going to be in your group and whether you're going to stay connected. It really seems like there's usually one or two people that initiate that. And then if it's a cohesive group. So I can't guarantee that. But I think that was definitely an advantage mm-hmm. for your group. What else have you noticed has changed since you took the group? And did you were you aware of changes immediately or did it take time or was it just so natural that it's like, I don't know, it just happened. It took time. So I had a lot of resistance to change. Change is hard for me anyways. Um, But changing the way that I showed up in the world and in my workspace and in my family and in my friend groups, it took some time to fully embrace that change. I was excited to change. I knew that change would be good for me, but it was actually like taking that step and saying, okay, I have a voice and it needs to be heard. That was difficult. But once that, it's almost like just jumping into the water. Like instead of putting my toe in, I just jumped. And then once I I was like, all right, this is who I am. This is what I need. These are the changes that I'm going to be making. Everyone was super supportive of that because they saw how much happier I was, how much more I was enjoying life. I was more fun to be around because I was having a good time. I had the energy to be with them. So everyone was in my life was super supportive of the changes that I made. I didn't have that guarantee when I took that leap of faith, but they were there for me when I finally decided, okay, change time. And then it happened fast. (laughs) What was it that was hard for you to allow yourself to be seen before? Do you know? It was hard to be sensitive in front of people. What I mean by that is like, if a noise isn't bothering anybody else, I'm going to try and pretend like it's not bothering me. Or if a smell isn't bothering someone else, I would pretend it's not bothering me. It was. It was pretend. (laughs) It was bothering me. But I tried to just kind of fit in with the crowd. Whereas once those changes started to happen, I would get up and leave the room. Or I would say, does anyone else hear that ticking noise? And then I'd go find where it was and turn it off. And then without a doubt, someone else in the room would say, oh my gosh, that was driving me nuts. So it's not just me. There were those little validating things. I'm freezing too. <laughs> right. And and what I find so often with the work that I do with HSPs is we often look around and if nobody else is saying anything or we look for the rules. And what I hear you saying is you started to get clear of that noise is bothering me. It's too hot. It's too cold. And you would voice it and then other people would come forward. And I can't tell you how many times I'm struggling with something and I don't want to share And then I finally realized that I need to. And, you know, people will write in and say, like, you're in my head. How did you know? Mm -hmm. Or I attended this online women's meeting the other day. And I was really trying to decide, like, do I fit in? Do I not fit in? And did I want to share? Did I not want to share? And then I shared something. And after that, the next four or five people talked about what I was sharing about. And so I often have that thing of, like, I don't fit in. What's wrong with me? And then when I get the courage to just feel the fear and do what I need to do anyways. And people, it really resonates. And so what I hear you saying is that you had the fear and you knew that you needed to do what you did. And then when you had a really different experience, it's like that narrative that we run in our head, like, oh, maybe that's not true. You know, I'm having this really different life experience and our our lives open up and really expand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with horses too? I grew up with horses. Um, I've always had a horse and 
the training's kind of been self-taught. If you ask, you know, 30 different horse trainers how to fix a problem, they're all going to tell you something different. Like everyone is very opinionated. Their way is the right way. It is the only way, even though there's a million ways. And I've always been pretty sensitive to animals and the needs of others, how, you know, others are feeling, but that included animals. And so I would see some training methods that I was like, man, that horse looks really scared. It doesn't look like it's being a turd. It looks, or it's being defiant or rude. It looks like it's terrified. And that's why it's not doing what you're telling it to do. And I was never a roper. Like I couldn't rope cows because I always felt bad for the cows. And I had some, some of my friends make fun of me. Like you're the only cow guru I know that doesn't rope because I felt bad for the cows. So I've always been like kind of the odd man out in that culture, especially in like Western horsemanship. And it wasn't until recently that I found a positive reinforcement trainer who is very in tune with animals. I would not be surprised if she was a highly sensitive person as well. And her whole method revolves around respecting the horse as a horse, not as a person, not as a complex thinking being who's out to get you personally (laughs) as a horse. What does that animal need in that moment? And how can you give your horse a choice to say no, which is like, unheard of in horsemanship. The horse doesn't get to say no, but in her training, it does. And once the horse knows it can say no, it can give you a true yes. And then it can start wanting to interact with you. Um, My horse that I've had for about 12 years passed away the beginning of this year. And I gave it some time before I was ready to adopt another horse. And I got a five-month-old little Mustang baby horse (laughs) who's completely wild and untrained. And I'm going through this training journey with him using her method and using her training course that I'm taking online. And it's pretty incredible how quickly the baby, is. his name is Ren, how quickly Ren is progressing in his training without using any of those kind of aggressive methods that I've seen other trainers use. I'm doing it the air quotes nice way and we're still accomplishing amazing things. And so it shows me like, oh, this whole time where I was like, oh, I don't really want to get my own horse to train because I can't be mean to it. You know, I can't hit it with a stick or like yank on it. It just feels or scare it. It just feels wrong. Well, I don't have to do that. And I'm still able to accomplish really cool things with him. Yeah, that's amazing. It's interesting. My mom just got a little dog that's a long-haired Dachshund Pomeranian mix. And my mom has her own places attached to ours. But because my mom is in her 80s, she really can't take the dog for adequate walks. And because we walk Gracie twice a day, we take her dog Hope. And Hope is a very, very, very frightened dog. She's calmed down. We've, We've had her about three weeks now. And I just spoke with somebody. Again, I'm anticipating doing a a bonus episode about this. We'll, we'll see. But I spent about an hour and a half on the phone with a trainer yesterday because my belief was if I could train the dog, I could control her so she wouldn't be reactive. And when she would be reactive, I got really angry. I I didn't do anything to the dog, but it really activated this really young anger and frustration and that I couldn't control the dog and the walk started to not be very fun. And after talking to the trainer, like some behaviors are just really okay. And I noticed that this morning when we walked the dog, she was pretty activated and pretty reactive. And I just thought, it's just her energy. And what I need to do is to let her be reactive, reassure her, keep her moving so she feels safe. Like it doesn't work to stop and to try and get her to calm down because it it just, she gets more and more activated. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm enjoying being with her and like, she just needs to be reassured and we just need to kind of keep moving. And so it's that same thing of, I don't need to get into a power struggle And then I feel powerless and then I get angry because I don't have control. And it brings up a really, um, (laughs) brings up a part of me that I really don't care too much for, you know, and to know that there are ways that we can interact where we can keep peace and allow people to be or animals to be where they need to be and and change can come from that place of love and kindness. Mm -hmm. And that's that like power struggle that you talked about. I mean, especially in just as traditional like cowboy horsemanship is you make the animal do it. Like it doesn't get to tell you no, and that's disrespectful and you need to earn respect. And so for me, if that would bring out like a lot of anger and like this angry fear response of, well, am I in danger? Like, is this animal going to hurt me? Do I need to act big and scary? And I didn't like the way that felt. And I, for a while, they're just considered, maybe I just don't want a horse. Maybe I just don't want to spend time with these animals anymore because I just have to get angry. I have to scare them. I have to do these things that is just really accepted and normal. And, but it just felt wrong to me. And so finding someone else who shared that belief and going, wow, there is a different way to honor the animal where they're at 
and, you know, meet them at that place and build that relationship in a way that they can understand and they can still have what they need. It was totally life changing. And I've, I have enjoyed horses more since I started that program than I probably have my whole life. Right. And how we can translate this to being an HSP is I think many of us were raised with that, just suck it up, just get through it, just push to not honor our feelings, to not be emotional. And, you know, everybody gets to decide what works for them. I've gotten the most healing. And when I work with other HSPs is what's going on with you? What are you feeling? What are you needing? And when we allow that energy to come all the way through and to move through us, it's fine, but there's so much fear about allowing those feelings to come up that we fight it and we resist it. And then we get into a power struggle with, you know, not crying or not being sensitive or not getting emotional, over controlling. And when we can just relax in that. So getting clear on what your beliefs are and making sure that you find support people around you that have those same beliefs so that that gets reinforced, which is what I hear you saying happen not only with the group, but also finding a trainer and getting clear on what you need to do with your life. And so it's like you're finding places where you f- that fit you as opposed to you trying to fit in with them. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. Just because that's what you see the majority of kind of reflected back at us culturally doesn't mean that that's the culture you have to take part in. Like there are all these little circles that you can find your people. You can find people who share the same thing. And that's not to say those are the only people I'm going to have in my life. Most of my friends, family, coworkers are not highly sensitive people. I think I have one client who might be a highly sensitive person. So I'm still out there interacting with people who are not highly sensitive. That's just a part of life. But I'm able to do that because in the areas I can control, I'm being respectful of my highly sensitive needs. Yeah. Yeah. When you were talking earlier, what I was thinking of for people that are listening, when Kelsey was talking about her job, not working for her, I was, I was wondering is as the listener, if you think about what is that one thing in your life right now that if you could make some shifts, you would make some shifts just to bring it to awareness. I'm not telling anybody to quit your job, get a new career. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that. Where are those areas where you feel like you're supposed to be sucking it up and you really need to just let it be okay. I I just think that might be helpful. I don't know. When you were thinking about signing up for the course, how long were you thinking about signing up for the course before you signed up for it? Maybe a few months. I saw you guys start to post about it and say there's a course coming up and I'm a professional development nerd. I love reading books that help me and me grow. I love anytime there's professional development at my school, I signed up for it. I love learning. And so I was like, oh, this would be a really cool thing. I've already read Elaine Aaron's book. I had read a bunch of highly sensitive blogs and watched videos. And I felt like this would just be a really great avenue. And then you made a podcast episode about it. And it kind of sparked up at me again, like this might be something I want to do. And then I put it aside. You had posted something about like, if there's a reason why you're not signing up, email me or message me. And so I reached out. And that was a little bit scary, but I reached out and asked and you said, well, you know, what's going to work for you? And we were able to work something out. And at that point, I was just absolutely elated to take that leap and learn more about not just myself, but other people who share the trait. Mm -hmm. What were you hoping to get out of the course? Can you, can you remember Mm -hmm. back then? I know it's been a long time. I was really excited to learn more. Like I just wanted to suck up as much knowledge as I could about what is highly sensitive? Why do I do these things that I do? Why do these things? So kind of to learn more about me and and how that highly sensitive trait looks in myself, I was not expecting in any way, shape or form that this course would change things for me in the magnitude that it did. Why don't you just talk about the ways that it's changed for you? Well, (laughs) I'm a million times happier than I was when I started the course I am very open with people about being a highly sensitive person. I'm like the first one to bring it up. I'm like, hey, I'm a highly sensitive person. That bothers me. I'm going to go move it over here or whatever, you know, situation it is. I'm more respectful of my needs. If I need to stay home from a friend's outing, I will without any guilt or shame that I need that. I'm just going to make sure that I, I give myself what I need in that situation. And then just my career change, my horse training methods, like, Pretty much every aspect of my life has had a major shift that has made my life that much more enjoyable because I'm not fighting 
the world 24 seven. I'm not trying to suck it up every second of every day. I'm able to kind of move through the world in a way that works for me. And that's the first time that I've ever had something like that. And it was so great with my career that I was like, I'm going to change it with horses and I'm going to change it with this. And I just kind of started weaving those highly sensitive, friendly things throughout my entire life. And now I'm not on the defensive. I always, I mean, I really struggle with just, I felt like I was angry all the time. And it was just like this wall was up or like a coiled spring. I just was so tense all the time because I was constantly defending myself from things. And now I can be a lot more soft because I've made sure that I'm taken care of. Yeah. Well, what I hear you saying is that you were really trying to struggle and to fit in and trying to be like everybody else and it just didn't work and it was making you frustrated and tired and exhausted and angry. And when you started to get clear on what it was that you needed and how you could make your environment work to fit you without having to change anybody, that just opened up this sense of freedom and curiosity and setting boundaries and taking care of yourself. So, which is really what we want. We want to come from a place of, we know what we want and we can do it with kindness and respectfully with respect without stepping on other people. And I think that's the fear that people think that people are going to get mad at me or I'm going to be rude or I'm going to be difficult. Have you felt like you've been rude or difficult or there's something unappealing in your person when you're taking care of yourself? No, not at all. I actually feel a lot better than when I was trying to force fitting in. I mean, the people, people aren't dumb for the, for the most part, my friends are very intelligent and they're very um, like socially mature and they could tell if I was, something was off and I was trying to just go with the flow. And so I feel like me taking care of myself has not only opened the door for like some genuine interactions, but it's also given the people around me permission to take care of themselves. And I'm starting to see my friends and my family step up for themselves and say, Hey, I need this. And because it went well for me and because people were accepting for me, or even if they weren't, the world didn't stop turning. Now they're empowered to take a step up and say, Hey, I need this thing. And then pursue that. We really get to model when we do our own work and we show up in the world in a way that feels good to us. We give other people permission to take care of themselves and to be vulnerable and to be open. And then it's, it's almost synergistic. I totally, I totally lost my question. I was like right on the end of my time. I'm like, boom, it's totally gone. Oh my gosh. I'm trying to just slow the process down and figure what the heck just happened. 25, 29. Oh, so when you have struggles and setbacks and bumps now, because your life isn't perfect. It's no. not like taking this course and now you're living this charm <laughs> life. But can you talk? So I want to be really clear, like this is not a course that we're still humans and life is mm-hmm. really messy. When you have bumps and setbacks and frustrations, how is that different than before? When things get hard, I think the biggest difference is that I'm not adding to it. Like I've always been my the my own worst critic, being able to be kind with myself when I'm having a hard time or when I'm in a hard place or when something terrible happens and just letting myself feel what I need to feel without judgment coming from myself. Even if there is judgment coming from other people, I'm not adding to it and making it worse. That's huge because instead of being, you know, my own worst enemy now, I can be my own friend. I can help myself through these hard times instead of being like, well, yeah, they're looking at you because you're crying, like stop crying or whatever it is. I just be like, well, I need to cry right now. Like this is what I'm feeling and it's a strong emotion and this is what I have to do. And I found that when I'm not playing that tape in my head, when that Sasquatch part of me isn't adding to that, I'm not seeing it in others either as much. But I still do have Mm -hmm. hard times. I mean, like you said, life isn't suddenly perfect, but it's a significant improvement from where I was, you know, constantly like in the ring, just fighting every day, but there still are storms that come. I'm just not in such a vulnerable place that I can't handle them when they come. Yeah. What I hear you saying is you're not in survival mode, that you're thriving. And so you have more energy and resources and resilience to deal with stuff when it comes up, because that's just what happens if we're alive. It's not about being an HSP. I don't care who you are. Life is going to throw us challenges and we need to find ways to use self-compassion to walk through really hard times. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. If someone is thinking about taking the course, they're like, you know, I don't like being in groups. I've taken courses before. They really don't do anything for me. I know about being an HSP. Is there anything that you would say that, that might offer a perspective that I don't, I haven't been able to? I was kind of going in it from an information perspective. I wasn't really going in it. I didn't think my life needed change. I thought I was fine. Like work was great. Life was great. My friends were like everything to me was exactly how it should be compared to, you know, the rest of the world. And so I wasn't going in it for change or support or anything like that. I was just interested to learn more. Um, And I had this kind of outcome. So if you are looking for change or you are considering, "Mm, I kind of, you know, maybe I'm thinking about changing this part or I just want to learn more or I'm just bored at home in quarantine and (laughs) I've got some extra time to explore being an HSP. I would really recommend that you take that leap of faith because even like, like me, I wasn't going in for a reason to change from the empowerment that I got from the other HSPs in the group and from your guidance in the group really incredible things happened, not just in my external world, but also in my internal world in the ways that I view myself Mm -hmm. and treat myself that I wasn't even aware of until I took the group. Yeah. I think in your, in your situation, you were fortunate because your expectations were not about connection and making changes that you just went in for the experience. And one of the challenges as people listen to these interviews is that how can you not have expectations about, I'm going to find this group of people and I'm going to connect and I'm going to make these major changes. And it may or may not happen. I have no control over that. But I think if people go in with an open mind of, I'm going to get what I need to get and whatever I put out is going to help to create more of that. And maybe we'll stay connected. Maybe we won't. But I I really trust and I tell my clients is that, you know, whatever comes up, is what needs to be healed. And I trust that process. And I trust that you're going to get what you want. And I think it does get a little bit more challenging as people hear about the course, that they go in having those expectations and how can you not have them? But, you know, I can't guarantee what someone's going to get out of the course. I've, I've seen people's lives just transform and change. And it's just so powerful. And I still feel like I can't really articulate why it's such a powerful experience. Well, and even if you don't connect with the people that are in your group. I was super fortunate. My group was full of people just like me and we all immediately on meeting number one, it was like, we've known each other our whole lives. It was amazing. But even if that's not the case, because of the things that you learn and start to implement in your own life, you're going to be finding people that you will connect with. Like at work, when I said, is that ticking driving? And it was like during a staff meeting, is that ticking does anyone else hear that? And I went and found this clock in the back and like took the battery out. And another person went, oh my gosh, that was driving me nuts. And we kind of talked about it. She's one of my great friends. Like, (laughs) so you'll find people that are like you or that are highly sensitive, maybe in, in your own life, even if it's not through the group because of the group. Yeah. Yeah. I think what was different about your group was it was maybe the first or second session. And Ranielle and I talk about this. So I, I'm not sharing anything that's private. She talks about it on her podcast interview. But there was something going on and she had a, a pretty emotional experience very, very early on in the group. What it did was it allowed people to see how the group could be a very safe, supported, warm, nurturing place. And Um, And I think that session brought up something for you. And so I I suggested that you turn off your video and take a step away so that you could get in touch with what was going on. And then you came back and then you also shared from a very deep place. Like your group just was kind of in this place that they were ready to do that. And I think because Ranielle had something very emotional that had happened and she shared it and, you know, she was ready to share it, that that really kind of brought everybody to a much deeper level, much quicker as opposed to, you know, well, I struggle with this and I struggle with that. I don't mean to minimize anything. Everybody's where they need to be. But I think that was one of the unique things about your group. And I've I've seen that happen in other groups, but your group just was unusually cohesive. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of that small talk kind of surface level issues that we would feel comfortable telling anybody. I mean, she came out with a very emotionally intense situation and listening to her talk, it was like she was in my head. It was something that I wasn't ready to deal with. And she was right there in front of me dealing with it, like in front of us. And the way that the group came to support her was extremely like 
activating for me. And I, you know, I got very emotional as well. And that's when you, you know, you said, do you need a minute? And and you even giving that permission, like, hey, I'm acknowledging that something's happening with you. What do you need right now? And I was able to turn off my camera and just go like, have a moment and kind of process and then come back to the group when I was ready and say, okay, I'm ready to do this. And then the group was there mm-hmm. for me in the same way. It was a pretty unique experience like I've never had before because people in that group, and I feel like other highly sensitive people as well, are really able to feel with you instead of feel for you. Mm -hmm. And so they were taking on a lot of that emotional load as well and helping me carry it and helping her carry it. And that was really cool and not something I found outside that group. Yeah. And when you say you got activated, can you say a little bit more about that? Because I I think of activated as something (laughs) negative sometimes. Yes. Instead of, I kind of use it instead of triggered because I feel like triggered, I just think of like anger versus like it like activated an emotion in me that I had been really suppressing in terms of like some childhood stuff, stuff that I had really been bottling up pretty intensely and ignoring and putting on a shelf and letting it collect dust. And then there she was talking about it like she was, you know, reading my own book that I wrote about this. And it brought that emotion. I mean, it really uncorked that. And it brought all of that emotion up pretty intensely in a way where I could no longer keep it down. And that was when you kind of recognize that there was a shift. And I felt like I was keeping my game face pretty good, but I obviously was not. And you were able to say like, Kelsey, you know, this seems like it's bringing up something for you as well. And we actually went through like an exercise. I don't know if you remember where you kind of talk to your younger self and like, what would they need in that? Mm -hmm. And that was pretty transformative for me, but I wasn't ready when I came into the group. I wasn't looking to handle that situation. I was never going to handle that situation, but watching her do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if I recall, those were tender, vulnerable feelings that you had not been allowed to feel or express. So again, when I think of activated, I think of like angry and upset, but it was very tender Mm -hmm. feelings. And so when you saw Ranielle have those feelings come up and then how the group responded to her and then it activated your own tender feelings. And so it really created a safe space for that, that really young part of you that felt really wounded and not seen and heard. Mm -hmm to allow her to be seen and heard and and to really get some love and healing. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at time and we're actually past time. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you think is important to share before we end? No, I would just encourage anybody who's considering taking this group to do it. Yeah, it's, it's been transformative. It really has been. So I am so excited about all the changes and, you know, what I... What I hear from you is that you've really identified what it is that you want to need. You validate yourself. Those needs are real to yourself. And so you're leading in your life with, this is what works for me. This is what would help. This is what I want. And you're really allowing the environment to kind of fit to you as opposed to you having to fit into the world. And that's just creating so much freedom and spaciousness. Still has challenges, not a perfect life but so much more freedom and self-compassion and love for who you are and how you show up in the world and creating relationships that really honor and support who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not whenever I thought about, Oh, I need this or I want that. It felt selfish. And I think that's something, especially a lot of women get is you're being selfish if you're putting your needs first, but it's more selfish for me to show up as a shell of who I should be because I'm not taking care of myself. And I think that realization was really what I needed to make those changes. Yeah, that's really powerful. How's Sasquatch now? A lot quieter. Back out in the woods. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and that's another thing, like you knew when we started, like, do I need to do I need to name this or do do I need to go? Thanks for sharing. And, you know, you can go play in the woods. Like that's also part of knowing you know, what do I need to do with Sasquatch or my gremlins? And so that's empowering. And then it's nice to do a check-in at the end, like, oh, he's out playing in the woods. Yay. All is well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Kelsey, thank you so much for sharing today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. All right. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye. Hey, again. I'm curious to know what you thought about that. And I really would encourage you to think about What are the areas in your life that are not working for you? Where is that you need to make a change or it feels scary? 
You don't have to do anything about it right now. You don't. What I know for me is that there's often a stage where I need to really be okay with my resistance and to not be ready to change, but just to be able to name it. I would just love for y'all to have that opportunity. I'm not sure where we're going to be with the online HSP courses by the time you hear this. I have a couple people at this point. You're going to hear this a few weeks after we recorded. I have a few people that are signed up for the Monday course. It's Pacific Standard Time at 3 p.m. This is in the year 2020. (laughs) Yeah, that year, 2020. If you go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com, if you go to the HSP groups page, there's all the information about the course. If you have any questions or reservations, please feel free to reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. I'm also going to list the episodes in the show notes where I've interviewed people that have taken the course. So if you're not sure and you kind of want to see what other people's experiences are, everybody has a different experience, but it's really been a positive experience and it's just exciting to watch people grow and change. So it's 2020, everybody. It's been a year, hasn't it? My hope is that you are doing well, that you are taking care of yourself, that you are able to really show up for yourself in a loving, nurturing, non-judgmental way. And if you're struggling, I'm really sorry. If you need to get some support, please reach out and get support. If it's just a hard time, this has been a really hard year and maybe a little bit of time before it starts looking any different. I don't know. All of your feelings are okay. Whatever you're experiencing is okay. My hope is that you're having some comfort, some support. Like I said, if you need to reach out and get support, one of the great things about the group that we just finished that we ran during COVID was we talked about what was going on in the world. We got a consensus initially about what people were comfortable talking about and what was off limits. As it turned out, we were all pretty much on the same page, but whoever needs the most space gets it. And it's really nice to have support while the world is in such a state of flux and transition. I think that's all I have to say. I hope you are doing well. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. 